for participating. They are the best of the best out of the respective schools within their own faculties, and they've, they've come this far. So, but in the end, we, we, we normally would have to have those two who will bet aloud. And the, judge, the judgment of this is our judges in front of us. So we have distinguished judges. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, Professor Gena and Mrs. Wilkins. Ms. Wilkins is our Deputy Registrar of, the, of Academic, and this is a final service with us. She will be retiring, so it's special for us tonight to have her also. So the distinguished guests, the heads of schools, the heads of schools, particularly the heads of those schools who are within the faculties of engineering and sciences are here tonight, and I appreciate your presence. For those online, thank you for tuning in to watch your students participate tonight. And for those alumni elsewhere also, welcome tonight, and sh we are sharing this moment with you. So with this, I'd like to say welcome to everyone tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horake, for the opening speech. Right, according to our program, the next speaker, the next speaker is going to be uh, SEMT Rep and uh, Vice Chancellor Academic, Professor Carl Gena. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome to the podium, Professor Carl Gena. Prof, thank you. Thank you, uh, MC, and good night to everybody. Uh, thank you all for your presence uh, this evening. You are gracing a very important occasion in the uh, academic calendar where students uh, need, need to best add up through the debate uh, process. And I think uh, most of the schools or faculties have contributed to the success uh, uh, of this debate. And uh, I think uh, from HOD of uh, CDS, I think, uh, she has basically revealed the future going forward. And the union uh, board used to sponsor this occasion, but because the union board has its own uh, case law challenge uh, this year, so we have asked the uh, university to pocket 50% uh, of the cost. So the, its academic uh, departments have contributed about 1,200 and uh, the uh, union board to contribute the other 50% to the overall cost of about almost 30,000 uh, uh, this year. So we are quite uh, honored to be the sponsor of this event, but uh, going forward, I think we should also reach out to the corporate entities in PNG to become the official sponsor of this program. So I will do my bit to look for money to uh, support uh, this event uh, next year. So. Union board uh, will retire by end of this year, and uh, next year we'll probably ask our corporate sponsor to pick up the uh, cost of the debate. So uh, on behalf of the uh, management and the union board, I want to thank the faculties and the schools that participated in this year's uh, debate. I think every good thing must come to an end at some point, and tonight is the night for the faculty of uh, science and the faculty of engineering to participate in this uh, final uh, challenge. And I would like to wish uh, both uh, faculties all the best. In any competition, one has to win and one has to lose. But the experience that you have gained through this uh, debate will help you to become a better person in the corporate entity that you work for, for those students, and those who have gone out of this university and they participated uh, in the debate, they are very well, they can articulate very well in their workplace, which is a plus for our students who are participating in the debate. So I would like to encourage those bystanders and uh, those who are here tonight to become a witness to acti actively participate. So it will give you confidence to speak in front of a uh, huge audience. So with those uh, few comments, I would like to wish both faculties all the best and the best team will win tonight. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Prof. Gena. 
Right, according to the program, the next, the next speaker is going to be Mr. Sefo, Deputy Chair for 2024 DOC. That will be myself. First of all, I'd like to begin by thanking SCMT uh, through Prof. Kaul Gena, uh, who's here and who gave us a speech. Every organization, they have administration and somebody has to head. And so he's, he's, one, uh, he's one of them and then that represent the SEMT. Thank you very much. Let's give it up for uh, SEMT through Prof. Gena. The next group of people I'd like to thank are the HOS of each of the schools. There are a number of them here. Thank you very much for making time available, HOS, for each of the, the schools. The two departments, the two schools who are debating tonight, uh, they've got the two faculties who are debating tonight, they have got their HOS. But I understand that some of the schools, the HOS have been supportive all along during this debate, 2024 debate. So let's give it up for HOS for each of the schools, ladies and gentlemen. Right, the next group of people I'd like to thank is the invited judges, the invited judges and the invited guests. They took up time, they made time available to come here and be the judges. So for that reason, I think we should acknowledge them and let's give it up for the invited judges. The next group of people I'd like to acknowledge is the debaters. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's give it up for the debaters. The second last group of people are the audiences. Otherwise, if you weren't there, we wouldn't be hearing the claps and cheers. So let's give it up for ourselves. And there are one or two relatives, spouses of the staff members who are here. We should also acknowledge their presence as well too. Let's give it up for them. The advisor has made a mention of it already. This has been a university sanction activity. So over the seven years, the DOC and the DCC has been organizing this debate through the assistance of the SEMT and the sponsors, uh, the union board. So let's give it up for the sponsors and the SEMT for their sponsor, making it possible for this event to occur. Let's put our hands together. Let me close with an experience. A student from an engineering, two years back, a student from, uh, that time it was school or department. So department of engineering, mechanical engineering, came running to my office and knocked at my door and said, Mr. Sefo, I'm here to ask you a favor. And he was sweating. And I asked him, what can I do for you? And the student said, I need a certificate, I need my certificate. What is this certificate? You're not from this department, yeah? Now, what do you need a certificate for? And this is what he said. You see, I was in an interview room, being interviewed by one of the uh, potential employers, and they asked me to produce a certificate, which I have took part in the debate, and one of the requirements was that I took part in public speaking like this. And so I rushed to the secretaries and told them to provide a certificate. Happened that we, we have already produced the certificate and it was there and no student was interested to come and pick up those certificates. So from there I thought, okay, so it is very important. The second reason why we have been running this is SEMT, it came to the notice of the SEMT and they said, our students, our final year students who get out there in the fields, 
They cannot strung words together in a sentence or in a normal conversation. Therefore, I think one of the ways in which we can improve their speaking and their English is through debate. That is the reason why they sanction this activity. And for seven years, we've been running this. The second reason is, if you have a look at these debaters, two things they are achieving. Number one, they are honing their reset skills. Once they have resets, they put information together, they organize them, they come up here and they present them and they argue them in academically professional way. Not like our parliamentarians out there, like little children playing marbles. I'm sorry to say that, but I think it is a fact. <laughs> so for those two reasons, for those two reasons, my challenge now is number two, num two fold. Number one, the students next year onwards, this debate is going to continue. Therefore, you have to put your hands up to take part in it. Yeah? Otherwise, those students who come up here, you're going to get motivated. So keep that motivation next year. Think about it, participating. Number two, the second challenge is to the HOS and the faculties. Hmm? Encourage your schools. Huh? Encourage them. Get at their back. Push them through, be it financially or morally. This is university sanction activity, and I've already spelled out the benefit of this debate. Uh, so next year on notes, please come on board and play an active part in it. Having said that, finally, faculty of sciences and faculty of engineering, this is how far you have come. Whatever you have prepared, within the five minutes and the seven minutes that you are going to present, the podium is going to be yours. Yeah? The podium is going to be yours. Whatever you have prepared, present it. Let's hear from you. And may the best team win. Let's give it up for these two teams and for ourselves. <laughs> My speech ends on that note. And the next, according to our program, is time for me to introduce the very important person who's going to take us through this debate, and that is the chairperson. And the person is none other than Dr. Pai himself from School of <laughs> Survey and Lens. Dr. Pai is the HOS for School of uh, uh, Lens and Survey. Ladies and gentlemen, again, let's give it up for Dr. Pai. Please, Dr. Pai. The podium is yours. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. Sefo, for a uh, very generous introduction. It's my pleasure to be here again. It is one of the things that uh, I look most, most forward to, when I think of PNG UOT, the confidence and astuteness that students apply themselves in arguing, in arguing their case. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you all to this grand final debate on the motion that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges of society and the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor of introducing you to our esteemed adjudicators for this grand final debate. I can inform you that the judging panel comprises guest adjudicators only. On this note, we cannot thank each one of them enough for responding favorably to the invitation to undertake this most profound duty tonight. Without further ado, 
allow me to invite each one of them to take their respective seat. Our first adjudic adjudicator is one of four or five professors, national professors that we have in PNG OT. They are rare species. He is also the dean of the national, or dean of the uh, natural sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome our first guest adjudicator for this debate, Professor McQueen Mino. Our next adjudicator is a senior member of the administration. She is the Deputy Registrar Academia. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome our second guest adjudicator for this debate, Mrs. Naomi Wilkins. <laughs> our last adjudicator is the training officer in the Training and Learning Methods Unit. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome our third guest adjudicator for this debate, Ms. Dora Kialo. <clears throat> Allow me to also welcome and invite the timekeeper for this debate, a member of the Debate Organizing Committee and also a faculty member in the School of Communication for Development Studies, Mrs. Lucy Maino. <clears throat> and now, ladies and gentlemen and debaters, please allow me to inform you of the seating positions in this house. Indeed, you may already understand from convention, the seating positions in this house. However, for formality, allow me to point out the positions as follows. On my right hand side will be the affirmative or the proposition team, and on my left side will be the negative or opposition team. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you the teams that will debate the motion before this house. In doing so, may I invite the debate teams to rise, to rise, please debate teams, rise. <laughs> and as I introduce you, please take your respective position in this house. For the affirmative side of the house, it gives me great pleasure to present to you the Faculty of Sciences. Please make welcome the first speaker, Miss Natalie Watts. <laughs> Natalie is a biomedical student. She's in year three. The second speaker for the affirmative side, Faculty of Sciences, is Miss Clemari Mission. <laughs> Clemari is in, a, in biomedical uh, year one. And the third speaker is Mr. Francis Abe, Applied Mathematics year two. Ladies and gentlemen, arguing for the motion before this house is the School of the Faculty of Sciences. <clears throat> now for the negative side of the house, it gives me great pleasure to present to you the Faculty of Engineering. Please make, make welcome the first speaker, Mr. Walter Luna, Civil Engineering Year One. For the negative side of the house, the second speaker, Ms. Shalita Cook, Mechanical Engineering Year Three.
And the third speaker for the negative side of the house, the Faculty of Engineering, Ms. Anna Sioni, Mineral Processing, Year One. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, arguing against the motion before this house is the School of Engineering. <laughs> Debaters, please take your seat. It is now my pleasure to read for you the rules of the debate as they have been given to me. Debaters, I call your attention to the requirements of timing in your presentation. To the first and second speakers for either side of this house, you have five minutes in total to present your case. In the fourth minute, you'll be reminded with one ring of the bell. In the fifth minute, you'll be reminded that your time is up with two rings of the bell. 15 seconds after the fifth minute, you'll, you'll be reminded to stop with three rings of the bell. To the third speakers of either side of this house, you have seven minutes in total to present your case. In the sixth minute, you'll be reminded with one ring of the bell. In the seventh minute, you'll be reminded that your time is up with two rings of the bell. 15 seconds after the seventh minute, you'll be reminded to stop with three rings of the bell. Thank you. A reminder to, to the audience. Firstly, Movements, I kindly request members of this audience not to move around in this chamber <laughs> whilst the debate is in process. <laughs> Secondly, I would like to remind you, the audience, to please, please reserve your applause, whether it's your clapping, your cheering, or your jeering, for the end when the speaker has completed speaking. Thirdly, mobile phones, I wish to advise you all in this chamber, put your phones off or put it to silent mode. These cautions are necessary to minimize all distractions to allow the speaker to continue unhindered. And it is also for the benefit of our adjudicators to remain undisturbed in their hearing. With the rules of the debate established, and agreed by both parties prior to the start of the debate. As a final reminder, I'd like to ask the audience to hold applause until the end of the debate, except for right now, you may show your love. <laughs> now that we have cleared all the preliminaries, allow me to remind you of the motion before this house. This House believes that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges of society and the environment. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let the debate begin. It now gives me great pleasure to recognize the first speaker, Ms. Natalie Watts, to open the case for the affirmative side. Ms. Natalie. It's the little things that citizens do. That's what will make the difference. A quote by Ms. Wangari Matai, founder of the Green Belt Movement. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed judges, timekeeper, chairperson, fellow debaters, and of course, the lovely audience. My name is Natalie Watts, and I am the first speaker of the affirmative team going for the motion 
that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges of the society and the environment. Now, as the first speaker, I will be defining key terms and providing examples. My second speaker, Ms. Claire Marie Mission, will be providing arguments on the social aspect of the topic. And my final speaker, Mr. Francis Abe, will be providing arguments on the environmental aspect of the topic, summarizing our team's arguments, providing valid recommendations, and leaving you all in no doubt on our stance as the affirmative team. Now, the topic can be a mouthful or can be confusing for you all, but allow me to break down the topic into four key phrases or terms, which will be defined for clear understanding. The first phrase, PNG's academic training, or de academic training as defined by the Kansas University, refers to educational programs, the curriculum, and practical experiences or training provided to students in academic institutions in relation to their field of study. Our second phrase, corporate responsibilities, as defined by the CIPD organization in 2024, refers to obligations or ethical commitments that companies or corporations in Papua New Guinea practice in which not only benefits their profit, but also positively impact the communities and the environment. Examples of corporate responsibilities include sustainable packaging, which can be seen practiced by the Coca-Cola industry, where can and bottles are recycled to reduce environmental harm. There's also getting involved in volunteer work or charity works in communities. This can be seen clearly exemplified by the Go Green initiative by BSP. Reducing carbon footprint, investing in non-profit organizations, products or services to social causes, funding educational programs, supporting health initiatives and so on. Our third key term aligned, mind you ladies and gentlemen, the term can have different or various meanings. However, it depends on the context in which it is used in. For instance, the term aligned used in a library context may refer to the arrangement of books in alphabetical order. However, in this context, as defined by the business map, align involves ensuring two or more entities, for this case, the academic institution and corporation, taking a coherent approach or a specific goal in addressing issues in the country. Our fourth statement, dynamic challenges of society and the environment are ever evolving social and environmental issues in Papua New Guinea. According to the United States of Institute of Peace 2024 states, and I quote, Papua New Guinea has a good number of societal challenges. These include economic instability, social inequalities, unemployment, poverty, resource depletion, health crisis, and the list goes on. This will be further elaborated by my second speaker. The environmental issues, on the other hand, involves environmental degradation, climate change, waste disposal, pollution, biodiversity loss, and more, which will be further elaborated by my third speaker. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, the topic is highlighting the importance and goal in which academic training and corporate responsibility work towards achieving in their own respective field or practices in addressing the changing dynamic, I mean the changing societal and environmental challenges, hence actively impacting the livelihoods of our communities in Papua New Guinea. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the opposing team may have you believe that there are misalignments in the academic training and corporations in mitigating the dynamic challenges of the society and environment. However, let me ask you all this question. If academic institutions in PNG are not aligned with societal and challenges, then why are universities incorporating sustainable development and environmental management curriculums in their institution? Furthermore, how can corporate social responsibility programs run by major companies in Papua New Guinea be ignored when they are actively engaging in environmental sustainability and community development projects. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we, the affirmative team, strongly believe without doubt that the 
Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges of the society and the environment. Thank you. I thank the first speaker for the affirmative side, Natalie Watts, for her speech. It now gives me great pleasure to recognize the first speaker, Mr. Walter Luna, to open the case for the negative side. Mr. Walter Luna. <laughs> A nation unprepared to stand alone is not ready for the challenges today and tomorrow. A quote by the late Sir Michael Sawara. Good evening, Chairperson, Judges, Timekeeper, fellow debaters, opposition members, and our lovely audience. I, Walter Luna, am honored to be the first speaker for the negative team going against this outrageous motion that claims PNG's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned with the dynamic challenges of society and the environment. I, Walter Luna, will define and speak on the academic aspect of the motion. Following me, our second speaker, Sheila Stein Cook, will elevate you to the economic heights of the motion. Finally, our third speaker, Ms. Anna Sioni, will navigate you through the environmental landscape of the motion. She'll summarize our points, conclude, and make recommendations affirming our stance as the negative team. So according to the Oxford English Dictionary 2019 edition, dynamic refers to constant change. Academic training refers to education aimed at skills development. And lastly, corporate responsibilities is the impact an organization has on its country. Therefore, the motion simply suggests that educational programs and corporate practices in PNG are already aligned to adapt to PNG's ever-changing challenges. So before moving on with my argument, the opposition speech has left you all stranded in Pluto. Let me be your guide back to planet Earth. The affirmative team had a beautiful storytelling without facts or arguments to back up the entire stance. Defining the motion only is not enough to convince the audience. Moving on. If our academic training were truly aligned with society's challenges, we would purely rely on our local workers instead of relying on local workers. Uh, we would purely rely on our local workers, but instead it is obvious that our country is surviving on foreign workers every time a crisis hits. It's like saying no local workers, no problem. Just fly in someone who looks like your favorite actor, Jackie Chan. <laughs> Take the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. Our local healthcare system was overwhelmed, and instead of relying on local doctors, we flew in over 60 expatriate doctors to manage the crisis. According to the national article titled, Manning Issues, Measures to Help Contain COVID-19, these 60 foreign doctors were a quick fix to cover the gaps left by our local healthcare professionals. This clearly shows that our training programs was not enough and is not aligned with the dynamic challenges of society to prepare these local workers for such dynamic challenges. Now, imagine the perfect world the affirmative team envisions, where academic training aligns completely with societal challenges and corporate responsibilities. If so, our courses would change constantly, leaving no time for students to master core industrial needed skills. Students here, imagine waking up each morning to a new syllabus because, oh, challenges changed overnight, changed overnight. In the article, The Global Educational Crisis, published by the Education for Global Development on January 4th, 2022, it was noted that universities in the United Kingdom aren't preparing students for dynamic challenges like unemployment, climate change, and air pollution. So if the UK, a global leader in technology, admits its academic training isn't aligned with its society's challenges and corporate responsibilities. How can the affirmative stand here and claim that PNG, a nation born yesterday, has already aligned? Since we're so aligned, the UK should just send its students to PNG to learn better aligned education. So it seems P 
PNG is the new beacon of progress in the world, huh? Who needs New York City when you've got Eriku and Taraka Market? <laughs> in conclusion, PNG's academic training fails to prepare our workforce, made obvious by our reliance on foreign expatriates during crises. Therefore, we, the negative team, stand firmly with all our hearts that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities is not, I repeat, is not, and for the last time, I repeat, is not aligned with the dynamic challenges of society and the environment. Thank you very much. I thank the first speaker for the negative side, Walter Luna, for his speech. I now call upon the second speaker, Ms. Claire Murray Mission, to continue the case for the affirmative side. Claire Murray. With great power comes great responsibility. A quote by Uncle Ben from the movie Spider-Man. Now, in context of this debate, this quote highlights how those in positions of power, such as academic institutions and corporations, have a duty to address societal and environmental challenges. A very good evening to our lovely chairperson, the distinguished adjudicators, our timekeeper, my fellow debaters, worthy opponents, and the lovely attentive audience. As mentioned by my first speaker, I, Claire Marie Mission, the second speaker of the affirmative team, will be providing examples and evidences that support our stance that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges of the society and environment. But before we begin, let us address a misleading statement that was made mention by the negative team. Now, the negative team made mention something along the lines that dynamic cha changes, that there are constant dynamic challenges meaning the challenges are always changing, and the, therefore the, circulum, the current circulum does not go in line with these di um, dynamic challenges. However, according to the National Department of Education, an article published by the National Department of Education in the year 2022, the reason they have circulums, they, the reason, the reason for these dynamic challenges is the reason why they have circulums to support the ever-changing dynamic challenges in this country. Now, with that being said, according to an article published by the Human Rights Watch in the year 2020-21, Papua New Guinea faces a host of dynamic challenges. And to name a few, we have economic instability, political instability, poor law and order issues, failing health system, a lack of inf infrastructure, and many more. Now, you might wonder, how are these academic trainings and corporate responsibilities addressing these issues? Well, here are some examples. Firstly, in the realm of academic training, we have the formal education sector. And a very good example of how formal education is aligned to the dynamic societal challenges is the Divine Word University Faculty of Arts and Social, Social Studies curriculum. Now, in this curriculum, students studying PNG studies and international relations in the third year learn about community development needs and how to create policies that solve these needs. Also, in that same year, in the second semester, these students learn about a subject called peace and conflict studies, in which they learn how to me mediate and negotiate conflicts, while at the same time developing strategies for maintaining peace. This in turn solves the societal challenge of poor law and order. Now, moving on to the vocational sector, and mind you, you might think that academic training only focuses on universities, but no, it focuses on both primary, secondary, and vocational sectors. Now, in the vocational sector, we have a program called Technical and Vocational Education Training, or TVET program for short. You see, these programs provide practical and relevant skills that match industry demands, equipping individuals with skills in various fields such as tourism, agriculture, and manufacturing, whereby it solves the societal issues of unemployment and improves economic development. And a good example of this is the Australian Pacific Technical College, or APTC. Now, with that being said, let us move on to the corporate responsibilities realm. In this realm, we have a type of corporate responsibility known as ethical practices. 
And a good example of this is taken from a brochure published in the year 2022 by the Bank of South Pacific, in which the Bank of South Pacific implemented financial literacy programs to over 160,000 participants across this country. Now, it, it, this financial literacy program taught them about budgeting, saving money, and managing debt, making these 160,000 individuals financially literate. Now, to conclude, the negative team would have you believe that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are insufficient in addressing the dynamic so social and environmental challenges we face. However, these examples overlook the significant progress and ongoing efforts made by the academic institutions and corporations like Divine World University or TVET programs and the corporations like Bank of South Pacific. In light of these examples, it is clear that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are not only aligned with, but are addressing the current societal dynamic challenges and the environmental challenges we face. Supporting this topic means to recognize and continue to build on these successes, ensuring a resilient and sustainable future for our nation, which in turn supports the whole theme for this debate. With that being said, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pr pleasure that we, the affirmative team, go for the motion that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges of the society and environment. Thank you very much. I thank the second speaker for the affirmative side, Claire Marie Mizian, for her speech. I now call upon the second speaker, Ms. Shelita Cook, to continue the case for the negative side. Shelita Cook. <clears throat> In a country where people build homes and settlements, how can anyone say our corporations are prepared for the future? Don Polio, current opposition leader of PNG. Thank you, Chairperson. Good evening, honorable judges, punctual timekeeper, for the opponents, and the esteemed audience. I am Shiloh Stein Cook, the second speaker of the negative team, going against the motion that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are not aligned to the dynamic challenges of our society and environment. As mentioned by my first speaker, I will speak on the social, socioeconomic aspect of this topic. But before I go on to my point, allow me to shed light on the darkness that was bestowed by the affirmative team. Now the evidence that was presented by the affirmative team is insufficient to support their claim. They mentioned something along the lines of dynamic academic challenges and curriculum updates. The opposition argues that curriculum updates happen incrementally but data from the 2023 Academic Audit Report reveals that over 60% of the curriculum in PNG's leading university hasn't been revised in the last 15 years. While other countries are rapidly adopting new technologies and methodologies, PNG's education system remains stagnant. In fact, a survey by the PNG Higher Education Research Institute found that 85% of recent graduates felt unprepared for the fast-paced, evolving demands of their industries. This is more than just a slow response. It's a system failure to us. Now, without further ado, let us dive into the pressing challenges that we face in Papua New Guinea. And these are economic downturn and urbanization. PNG has a high population growth rate and an increased rural to urban migration. This rapid growth of the urban population is putting immense pressure on the housing sector, leading to the rise of informal settlements. For example, Morata. It is one of the fast, fastest growing settlements in Port Mosby. As stated by Post Korea in 2023 in an article titled, the implementation of a national housing policy must be considered before adopting it. It states that the primary goal of the policy, National Housing Policy 1994, is to ensure that all Papua New Guineans have access to decent housing accommodation at an affordable cost by the year 2000. Now this was 24 years ago and this policy is outdated. How can we expect 
to address the challenges of today with a policy that was designed for a different era. Let me share some eye-opening statistics here. According to a research title, Exper Experience of Private Developers, published on the National Research Institute in 2023, private developers in Ley, like Ley Berdwing, have built houses but cannot sell them due to the ongoing economic downturn. Trying to align to the urbanization while being hit by economic downturn is like trying to build a skyscraper during a hurricane. If these corporations were genuinely aligned with the market's needs, wouldn't they be adapting to, the, to meet the demands of the growing population instead of sitting on unsold properties? Now let me take you out of the Pacific Islands into the United States. On an article published, Housing Crisis in the U.S., it states that despite having a lot of resources, American corporations still struggle with dynamic challenges like affordable housing, income inequality, and health care costs. So if a developed country like the United States, with all its skyscrapers, admits that its corporations are struggling to align to the dynamic challenges, how can the affirmative team claim that PNG, with all its settlements, have its corporate responsibilities aligned to its dynamic challenge? To conclude, if Papua New Guinea's corporate responsibilities and academic training were truly aligned with the dynamic challenges, we wouldn't have housing crisis that even high-income earners can't escape. We would have solutions. We would not have any excuses. With that being said, with a negative theme, strongly believe, and we go against the motion tonight that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are not aligned to the dynamic challenges of our society and the environment. Thank you. I thank the second speaker for the negative side, Shelita Cook, for her speech. It gives me great pleasure to recognize the third speaker of the affirmative side to conclude the case. Mr. Francis Abe. He who has a reason why to live can bear almost anyhow. This was a profound insight by a philosopher, Frederick Nitz, which reflects what, on what we are debating on tonight. As we, the affirmative team, are said that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges and dynamic challenges of social, of the social and environment, our environment within our society. Good night once again, ladies and gentlemen. As mentioned by the first speaker, I am the third and final speaker for the affirmative team who will be going for the topic and presenting environmental points of argument on this topic, summarizing our stance and also providing actionable recommendations to help build a more sustainable future for Papua New Guinea. But before moving on into my arguments, the opposing team did paint a picture that was seemingly convincing if only their arguments weren't based on facts that are, well, not in context with this topic. They talked about a national housing policy. Well, that policy is to do with, a, it's a government policy. It's not part of a corporation's social responsibilities. You cannot go and ask BSP to build your house for you. No, you cannot do that. They're going to make a profit at their own expense. This is your government's responsibility. With that having been said, I will now move on to my environmental points of argument. And the first being academic training in environmental management. Papua New Guinea's universities are increasingly focusing on environmental management as part of their academic training. For instance, UPNG in their reviewed and updated curriculum in 2019 have implemented a curricula that includes hands-on training in environmental assessment and management where students engage in community projects that focus on biodiversity, conservation, and pollution control, while this, where this ensures that they are well-versed in their real-world applications of their studies. 
Now, what I've stated is just but an example that serves as proof that our academic institutions are indeed aligned with the environmental issues present within our society and are working towards addressing them. My second point of argument is that of corporate social responsibilities or CSR. Now CSR is a business model that helps a company or corporation be socially accountable to itself, its stakeholders, and more specifically to you, the general public. Corporations in Papua New Guinea have taken significant steps to align their operations with environmental sustainability through CSR initiatives. A notable example of this is Oil Search Limited, where in an article published by the National on August 25, 2018, highlighted how Oil Search Limited has, had established partnerships between, with local communities to implement waste management programs that have reduced littering and pollution. They have also funded educational campaigns that raise awareness about environmental protection, such as the environmental awareness campaign that took place in the Southern Highlands in the year 2012, and have also partnered with institutions like the National Institute of Standards and Industrial Training to ensure compliance with environmental standards whilst providing training for local workers. Now, how long are we going to keep noticing the problems in our society and not the solutions that are already in play? It's like being short-sighted, right? These problems blur your vision. So let me, how should I say, give you my glasses so we both can see the solutions that are already in place. For instance, the opposing team may have you believe that the damage done by these corporations are not addressed. Seriously, specifically the main damage done by mining companies. To these criticisms, I respond and we argue that companies like the Barrick Gold Mine, which operates the Pogara Joint Venture, do adhere to environmental regulations and maintain an ISO 14001, which is an environmental management system that to monitor and mitigate the impacts of the mine as seen in their annual environmental report in 2020, where it highlights the significant investments made in community environmental in initiatives, such as partnerships with organizations like Conservation International to promote biodiversity and sustainable land use. Once again, how long are you going to keep on noticing the negative things that are happening in the society and not the solutions in play? Thus, this brings me to my summary. To summarize, we have effectively asserted our stance that Papua New Guinea's academic training programs and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges within our society and the environment. My first speaker has, uh, has highlighted several pressing social and environmental issues, including widespread poverty, inadequate waste management, and pollution. And these challenges do necessitate a response from both education or academic institutions and corporations, which my second speaker has demonstrated in her argument that yes, there is plans in place to address the social issues within our society for both the academic plans from both the academic institutions and corporations. For instance, the Divine World University's Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, where it offers a curriculum that prepares students in PNG studies and international relations to address community development needs and create effective social policies. Additionally, she also argued that there are TVET programs such as those provided by the APTC to equip students with practical skills relevant to social demands. Whereas on the corporate side, she has highlighted that corporations such as BSB have demonstrated a commitment to social responsibility as seen in the BSP's financial literacy programs initiated in 2014 that empower individu individuals, pardon me, to make informed economic decisions. And as me, as I, the final speaker for this argument, has stated that the environmental challenges are addressed through initiatives like the Oil Search Limited's educational campaign that promotes awareness of sustainability practices. And together, these efforts illustrate a comprehensive approach to solving Papua New Guinea's societal and environmental challenges through academic training and corporate responsibilities. Therefore, in conclusion, with all that has been said, it is undeniable that academic institutions and corporate corporations have programs aligned to address the dynamic social and environmental challenges, which is why moving forward, we the 
affirmative team recommend the following. Strengthen and create partnerships within academic institutions and corporations, firstly. Secondly, is to implement regular environmental audits. And thirdly, is to enhance public awareness campaigns. campaigns. Therefore, based on these arguments and recommendations, we, the affirmative team, strongly go for the topic that Papua New Guinea's current, uh, Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the ch dynamic challenges of our society and the environment. Thank you. I thank the third speaker for the affirmative side, Mr. Francis Abe, for his speech. It gives me great pleasure to recognize now the third speaker, Ms. Anna Sioni, to close the case for the negative side and indeed the whole debate. Anna Sioni. <clears throat> What we're doing to the forest of the world mirrors what we're doing to ourselves. When education teaches us to dig, but not to heal the land, how do we expect to prepare for the future? A quote by Mahatma Gandhi. Good evening, judges, chairperson, timekeeper, fellow debaters, and our esteemed audience. I am Anna Sioni, the third speaker of the negative team. I will address the environmental aspects of the motion, summarize our main arguments, draw conclusions and offer recommendations that challenge the motion that Papua New Guinea's tra academic training and corporate responsibilities are aligned to the dynamic challenges of the society and the environment. Before I dive into my arguments, I think it's only fair that we take a brief moment to address the creative storytelling we've just heard from the government. The affirmative team claims that education and corporate practices address environmental challenges. Yet, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization in 2020, PNG lost 3 million hectares of forests between 2000 to 2018. How is that sustainable? Now, let's dive into my crucial points. The motion that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are effectively aligned to tackle pressing challenges is not only misleading, but it also overlooks the significant imp negative impacts on both the environment and the people living within it. Firstly, let's talk about the academic training in PNG. Many programs are hopelessly stuck in the past, teaching outdated practices that don't address today's crucial issues like climate change and social equity. A report from the National released in January 2020 shows that our universities still teach mining methods that ignore the environmental challenges we face. This means graduates enter workforce utterly unprepared, lacking the skills needed to tackle real world problems. Given these facts, how can we honestly claim that our academic training is effectively aligned with dynamic challenges of society and the environment? The motion is clearly misleading. Now look at Australia. Even with some of the best mining regulations, a report from Australian Mining titled Navigating Future Water Risk in Mining released on May 2023 reveals that contaminated water from mining has caused serious health issues, including increased cancer risks for local residents. If Australia, a supposed leader in mining technology, can't solve these problems, how can we expect PNG's graduates, armed with outdated knowledge, handle similar or even worse challenges? And if Australia's having trouble, don't worry. Since we're so aligned, we'll send over a fresh graduate from PNG UOT to fix all their issues. Let's be honest about corporate responsibility in PNG. Many companies are laser focused on quick profits, ignoring long-term sustainability and causing environmental damage. The Octady Mine Disaster is a perfect example where poor waste management, contaminated water, and devastated ecosystems, as reported by the Post Korea on August 9, 2024. Communities are left struggling with severe health issues and lost livelihoods. How can we call ourselves responsible corporate citizens 
when such harm persists in our own backyard. This problem extends beyond just one disaster. Deforestation from mining is wrecking havoc, destroying habitats and threatening biodiversity, jeopardizing the livelihoods of countless communities. A study published in the Journal of Environmental Management by Smith et al. in 2019 highlights that environmental degradation often leads to social unrest. Clearly, our corporate responsibilities are not only lacking, but also misaligned with the dynamic challenges of our environment. The disconnect between academic training and corporate responsibility is a barrier we can't ignore. To summarize, my first speaker discussed how academic training doesn't meet real world problems, which makes us de depend on expatriates. The second speaker took a look at the socioeconomic side, emphasizing more on how corporate responsibilities are not aligned to the dynamic challenges. And finally, I talked about the environmental angle, st stating the negative impacts this misalignment has on the environment. My team and I brought forward evidence of very developed countries struggling to achieve this motion, while the affirmative team is still claiming that PNG, a politically unstable and underdeveloped country, has already achieved it. How? In conclusion, it is evident that PNG's academic institutions are not adequately preparing future leaders to address these dynamic challenges we face, and corporate responsibilities are falling far short because they're too busy chasing profit. Therefore, the supposed alignment in PNG is far from accurate. The reality is a disconnect that has the potential to endanger our future generation. As the negative team, we recommend the following to minimize the disconnect between the academic institutions and corporate responsibilities. One, add essential skills like critical thinking, problem solving, and adaptability to the curriculum so students can handle future challenges no matter how society changes. And two, the government in consultation with key stakeholders should review and update the National Housing Policy 1994 as well as promoting sustainable practices that protect, that protect the environment and local communities. We're not saying that being unaligned is bad. In fact, it can give you a wider perspective when entering different industries. Each industry has unique challenges that require adaptation. You can't teach a student everything they need to know about Esprit Brewery if they are applying to Pogera. It's like, it's like spending years in school, learning how to sail a ship only to get hired and be told to fly a plane. Therefore, we, the negative team, passionately stand firm and loudly proclaim that Papua New Guinea's academic training and corporate responsibilities are not, and I repeat, are not aligned to the dynamic challenges of our society and the environment. Thank you. I thank the third speaker for the negative side, Ms. Anna Sioni, for her speech. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the arguments from both sides on the motion before this house. Please join me in thanking both teams. I now call upon both teams to please rise. Rise. And cross the floor. Shake hands and embrace each other as a gesture of respect and goodwill for each other in this contest. <laughs> and you may take your leave. And you may take your leave. Ladies and gentlemen, I now move for a short recess to allow time for the adjudicators to, to consider their decision, which will be delivered in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>